Milo. Milo, take it away. All right. Thanks. This is a pretty good turnout. Oh, we're doing it with coffee. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> well, I've had the opportunity to spend some time in the Arctic uh, this past summer. Uh, part of it in Alaska and part of it in Svalbard, Norway, and I thought, well, maybe I could kind of find some common link and try to squeeze those two into one presentation. And as usual, I'm showing off pretty wildlife pictures, but I'll try to tell you a little bit about the area. And what I found interesting were the links, the commonalities between the two places and even overlap with here. And I'll try to uh, emphasize that as I go through. Um, I had time to do something in June that I haven't been able to do before, and that's run up the Dalton Highway uh, to you know Alaska's Arctic to Dead Horse and photograph birds. Uh, I've been wanting to do that for a long time, and I had a few target species, and one of the big ones was Smith's Longspur, a songbird that nests on the north side of the Brooks. Well, it's easier to find on the north side of the Brooks Range and target them, but also find a lot of other things. This is me driving uh, my car with my camper behind it up the Dalton Highway. This is uh, way north of the Brooks Range now. You can see the Brooks Range to the south of me. And this is like midnight. That's my shadow uh, to pulling the trailer on, on the Dalton Highway. Um, you guys probably know generally about the Dalton Highway. Uh, it is roughly 500 miles from Fairbanks to Dead Horse. Um, a lot of it's dirt. A lot of it's rough. It all depends on what, how you hit it and what the weather has been, and, and you know the road conditions can vary a lot. I, I had the road pretty good this time, but like late in the summer with a lot of rain, I've heard recently it's a mess, uh, you know, like in September it was. But in June, it, I, I had pretty good luck. Uh, so drove the highway from Fairbanks all the way up to Dead Horse right here, and uh, you know, pulling a trailer is a little bit of a challenge. Uh, you beat, you do beat things up, but all in all, uh, the, the drive went went well. Um, for contrast, I'm going to show you where I was later in the summer. So I've been working, I've been guiding trips to Antarctica with Chief, with Cheeseman's Ecology Safaris, and that led to me working for the same company uh, guiding a trip in Svalbard, Norway, this summer. And I want, if you guys aren't familiar with 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 the area. Uh, here's the Svalbard Archipelago, uh, used to be called Spitsbergen, it's part of Norway. Uh, the main part of Norway is down here. And Longyearbyen is the capital or the capital city, the main city in, in Svalbard where you fly in and out of. Um, anyway, it's way north and I'll show you how far north it is. Um, Oslo right here is 60 degrees, so roughly the same latitude as Cordova. Um, 70 degrees, which is the latitude of Dead Horse, uh, would be near uh, Lofoten, which is a pretty famous place for winter recreation in northern Norway. Uh, it's actually a little bit more down here. But uh, 70 degrees is northern mainland Norway, an equivalent to Dead Horse. And we think of Dead Horse and Prudhoe Bay as being way you know, north and Arctic. Well, Svalbard, uh, 80 degrees north anyway, the northern part of Svalbard, is 670 miles further north than Prudhoe Bay. So it's up there is all I can say. I was really impressed when I saw you know, how, how far north uh, that, that group of islands lies. Um, the first part of the trip, this trip up the Dalton Highway, I, I want to emphasize that as something that any of us can do. You know, the, the Svalbard thing's a little harder, a little more expensive to get to. But this is reachable. You know, we, we can go see all this stuff. So I pulled uh, my Forerunner with this camper that Paula and I just bought this spring and, and put it to good use. I had a kayak with me I ended up not using just in case I needed to cross the Sag River. It was really high, like uh, flood stage and stuff, so I, I didn't mess with that. Uh, but anyway, this is uh, what, how I was camping for about 10 days on, on this trip. In contrast, the trip to Svalbard, Norway, I, we flew to Longyearbyen, the, the capital that I just told you, I showed you, and got on this ship. It holds 12 passengers. There were two guides. Um, uh, I'll, I'll show you the, uh, the, the crew and the, and the guides uh, later on. But it's about a 100-foot vessel, um, and anyway, we visited the northern and uh, western coast by you know with with this ship 
Uh, anyway, this is a little bit harder to pull off, but uh, it, it was a really neat trip. It was actually two back-to-back 10-day -back trips with two different sets of 12, 12 passengers. So uh, the Dalton Highway part, we'll get to the uh, Svalbard uh, afterwards. Um, this is just the start of the, the Dalton Highway proper. I pulled over, everything's relatively clean and stuff at the start of the drive. That all changes with time. Here's what it looks like after the trip. Actually, the only places that were muddy were where the highway department had wet the roads for, for you know, repair work. Uh, I really didn't have any precipitation while I was there, and that was partly why the roads were in pretty good shape. But the construction areas uh, will you know, plate your vehicle with pretty thick, hard clay. Um, but all in all, uh, the driving conditions were pretty good, as I said. And then I parked this. Uh, I did park along the highway in different places. But uh, this was uh, right outside the town of Dead Horse along the Sag River at a pullout. I just parked it there and then did my photography and looking for birds and stuff uh, uh, just based out, based out of this spot right here. Uh, it was real handy. Uh, hope there is hotels in Dead Horse. They're probably 300 something a night or whatever, so it's not cheap. So you'd probably want to camp, uh, you know, find some way to camp. I don't have a lot of scenic pictures. This is uh, south of the Brooks Range looking back up at the Brooks Range. Uh, at midnight or you know, middle of the night. Uh, this is Galbraith Lake, running almost right in the Brooks Range. I know you've camped there, Karen. Uh, you guys were up there a couple summers ago. Uh, anyway, beautiful, beautiful country. And got a look, you know, you go there, I think I was there roughly 10th to the 20th of June, plus or minus a little bit. And it's still winter. All the bigger lakes were frozen. That's what I wanted to show with this. This is the, the main lake right that you know right, right in Dead Horse. Uh, it was mostly ice with just uh, uh, open water around the edges. Uh, most of the ponds were like that. And I got snow while I was up there. So middle of June, uh, it was still snow. This is a, a dusting of snow on one of the days, one of the mornings I was there. And you got to tune this out. If you're up there to look at nature and birds and stuff like that, you're in an industrial mecca. Uh, and, you know, it's where the pipeline starts. And uh, you're seeing construction workers who could care less what you're doing. You know, especially in the immediate road system, you get yelled at by some people. And uh, anyway, you got to tune all that out. Uh, here's a caribou with a big oil derrick in, in the background. Um, so, yeah, I was there to see the prettier side, the wilder side, but this is happening, you know, all around you when you're up there. The, the Dalton Highway proper, the Hall Road, you are, except for the highway, you know, more or less in the middle of nowhere, but around Dead Horse, which is actually really productive for some of these birds uh, uh, that I was looking for, um, you just got to deal with this. Uh, it, it's busy, you know, all 365 days a year, they're working up there. Um, so now to the wildlife. So I was there to see birds, and uh, it was really neat being there in the springtime, you know, during the breeding season uh, for, for birds up there. And I'll show you, you know, some of the common ones and then some of the at least rarities or stuff that we don't see very often down here. Tree sparrows were everywhere. Uh, but anytime you were in a riparian area that had willow or something like that, you were going to see tree sparrows. We rarely get those here. They're, they're more common, you know, throughout the interior of Alaska. But anyway, lots of tree sparrows. They were just sort of something you took for granted after a while. They were singing uh, just about everywhere. Latlin longspurs are everywhere. They, they were common. And uh, one of the main breeding birds on the tundra in the Arctic, they pass through Cordova you know, early in the spring. And sometimes during shorebird festival, we'll pick them up. Um, but anyway, they're a beautiful bird. It's neat to see them on the breeding grounds. They were very common all around the Dalton Highway and around the town of Dead Horse as well. Another common breeder up in the same area are snow buntings. And this is one of those things I'm going to compare to Svalbard, Norway. So uh, in that Svalbard archipelago, this is the only breeding songbird. And they were, especially around the, the well, everywhere we went on land, we would see snow buntings. So it was kind of cool to see, you know, some of the same species, uh, you know, sharing the, the, you know, the two places. White crowned sparrows, uh, whenever you were around some woody vegetation, uh, were another common uh, songbird on the uh, Dalton Highway and maybe not so much all the way up at, at Dead, Dead Horse. 
but anyway, they were another common breeder up in the Arctic. And then there were my lifers. Uh, some of the birds I was targeting and got the photograph and had some great luck with. Um, I think I got four blue throat, yellow wagtail, um, Arctic warbler was one I haven't seen, but it's not all the way up in the Arctic. And then uh, I'm forgetting one. Anyway, uh, the blue throat I only saw a handful of. I got some tips. Uh, there's somebody who posts regularly to the Alaska Bird Facebook page, somebody who works in the Arctic. He gave me some ideas of places to look for these. And they were kind of skulking. You know, they weren't, they weren't out and about, you know, in, any time you looked for them. Uh, and I did use playback uh, to attract them, you know, to, to try to get them out singing and stuff like that. They've got a beautiful song uh, that they mimic other birds and have a long and complex song. So it was beautiful to hear them as well. Uh, but I had great luck almost right off the bat with this individual. And it was really the only one that gave me good good opportunities, but I, but I couldn't complain. Anyway, these are an Asian breeder. Uh, they, they come, you know, from, from Asia. The weed here goes down to Africa. I don't think, are these in Africa? Yeah. No. Central, Central, Asia. Central Asia is where they winter. So anyway, they're coming over the bearing uh, uh, for the breeding season. One of the birds I was hoping to see most, just because I thought they'd been so gorgeous, uh, you know, when I've seen photos or, you know, in bird books, uh, was Smith's Longspur. And uh, I saw a student from the University of Alaska Fairbanks give a presentation once at a bird conference about this species. And I ran up afterwards. I go, where, you know, where can I see these? She was, she said, if you ever make it up there, I'll tell you, you know, where. Uh, that was many, many, 10 or 15 years ago. But I did get some tips, and, and it turns out this is a pretty easy bird to find. You don't really need any uh, secret intel to find them. Uh, on the tundra north of the Brooks Range, they're, they're quite common. And I had really good luck with them. And I just could not get enough. I was sleeping during the day and photographing all night. The, the, many of these images are taken at midnight, 1 or 2 in the morning, when the sun sinks down. It's just barely over the horizon. And it was just the most beautiful light to photograph in. And uh, anyway, I really enjoyed seeing these birds, and I had multiple opportunities. Uh, to photo the photograph. No, this is Smith's Longspur. Oh, okay, yeah, you. yeah, if I didn't say that. Yeah, again, this is 2 in the morning or something like that. Just beautiful birds. Uh, so really did well with them. I was really excited to find them. Another bird that I saw quite a bit, they're quite common, but I had a really hard time getting pictures. This is heavily cropped, was yellow wagtail, another Asian migrant uh, that uh, winters in Asia and comes over to Alaska to breed. Uh, anyway, beautiful bird. This is a female. The, the males have a little more striking coloration on their head. Um, but this is about all I got. And like I said, this is a heavy crop. So this is something for me to work on in the future. But this was a lifer for me and something I was excited to see. And I'm surprised at how common they were when you got along uh, floodplains and, you know, riparian areas. Uh, Northern weed ear. Uh, I didn't try for these all that much, but going over the Brooks Range, uh, it's not that hard to find them. Um, it was uh, on the, my way home that I, I, I just got a few images of, of this individual. I, this wasn't a lifer for me, but I'd only seen them once before uh, in the Brooks Range uh, on a sheep hunt, I believe. Uh, but what was kind of neat about this is after my Svalbard trip, I spent a little time in Norway and Sweden, and I saw one of these in Sweden. So it was kind of neat to see these uh, in two very different areas, you know, the same species. And then other highlights, you know, in fact, quite common. This is rock ptarmigan female with the Brooks Range in the background. This is Again, middle of the night uh, with beautiful low light. It was right near this male uh, displaying. They're starting to get a little dirty at this time in, in June. <laughs> Got to see a few mammals. Uh, I saw caribou here and there along the drive, not, not large numbers or anything. This is around the uh, Dead Horse town site, uh, and these were actually quite approachable. Uh, just went about their business grazing. Uh, Here's, uh, looks like two bulls, another one. And then along the drive, I saw a handful of grizzlies, uh, and some of them just kind of went about their business. This one actually had two cubs and kind of charged my truck uh, at one point. Uh, but here's a grizzly walking along the pipeline. This is uh, just a little bit north of the Brooks Range. 
uh, between uh, the Brooks Range, uh, Attigan Pass, and Galbraith Lake. The same bear, the beautiful coats, you know, so much different than the, the brown bears we see down here. Uh, most of them were quite blonde and, uh, you yeah, know, just this time of year had their thick winter coats on. I thought it was pretty striking. Here's another bear, again, way north of the Brooks Range. Yeah. Saw a handful of muskox. Um, I saw more when I drove the road in September two years ago, uh, but saw a handful of these. Uh, did see calves, but I didn't get a chance to photograph uh, the, the cows with calves. Here's another one that I found one morning with real thick fog. I was out on the tundra photographing Smith's long spurs uh, several hundred yards away from my truck, uh, and I looked back at the highway, and this red fox is trotting down the road, and it peed on my tire. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Oh. And then some of the birds I had really good luck with, these are some of the water birds that, that I was looking for around the Dead Horse uh, town site, you know, the ponds and wetlands uh, there. Uh, Pacific loom, uh, some of them were kind of wary, but and this was, uh, again, two in the morning. Uh, I just laid down on the edge of this pond, and this pair was kind of curious and came up to me uh, in beautiful, beautiful light. Were you in a boat? No, just laying on the tundra. Just uh, you know, I walked out to, to you know to the edge of the pond, uh, a ways out on the tundra. Uh, anyway, just spectacular seeing them in their breeding colors, and again in that beautiful, beautiful light. And then things that we well, you know, Pacific loons we see here in the winter time. You know, they they winter here. Um, in fact, they breed you know around Anchorage. Uh, Long-tailed duck uh, were common around the the. Uh, Dead Horse Town site. Uh, this is a male in breeding plumage. We see them you know, looking quite different in, in the wintertime around here. Here's a male taking flight. But what I was really hoping for was seeing the eiders. Uh, and I got to see quite a few both king and spectacled eiders. And again, this is something we can drive to. It's on the road system that you can get to if we have ferry service. Uh, <laughs> it, it, you could drive to from here uh, once you get to the road system. Um, so some of these birds were kind of wary, but I did some combination of you know crawling on the tundra or photographing from my car, but in a few instances had some that were quite cooperative, like this male right here. Here's one preening. I mean, photographing from my car uh, at the edge of a pond right in the Dead Horse Town site. So which species is this? King Eider. King and this is one of my favorite pictures of the year. Every year, on my, I do an update to my website with my 50 favorite images of the year. I know this one's going to be in there. Uh, I love having the, the hens and drakes uh, swimming straight at me with the ice in the picture, and you just can't get a prettier bird than this. I did see king eiders in Svalbard, uh, just a few. Common eiders were the main eider that, that we saw in Svalbard, uh, but we did see a few king eiders. Speck eider is probably maybe my favorite bird. They're so unique, uh, you know, their color patterns and stuff. And I saw a, a handful of these, and a handful were approachable. Um, this one I had to crawl on the tundra for a little bit. Uh, there was a, a hen and a drake together in this instance. Uh, this was right from the road, right, right in Dead Horse. Uh, a hen and a drake uh, together. And then they, for a while, were just resting on the tundra right next to the pond, just preening. Uh, so here's a drake, uh, speck eider, uh, just gorgeous, really unique uh, looking for, uh, ducks. Tundra swan, somebody was just talking about. Uh, they breed up there. They're, they're the only swan that's in, in the high Arctic. And uh, didn't see a lot of these, uh, at least near the road where I could photograph, but I did have a few good opportunities. And here's some greater scops swimming right by. Pair of tundra swans. And this was my favorite event of the whole of the whole trip. Uh, I was actually leaving and I bumped into a biologist who was somebody I'd been communicating with online about he, he's the one who turned me on to where to find the blue throats. And I was driving north, uh, you know, kind of just said I'm done, you know, for this trip. And he says, Do you know about the yellow bill bill loon nest? And I go, 
No, what is the old building? Nobody's told me about the old building. Blue nest. He goes, well, it's back up the road. I go, no, I'm not going that way. He says, just two miles. I go, really? <laughs> and it was getting a little late in the morning, but the light was still kind of nice. So I said, okay. And sure enough, uh, had to walk just a few hundred yards off the road. There was a, uh, a pair that was nesting on an island about 20 or 30 yards from the shore of the lake that you could walk to. And the, the female got off the nest briefly, but got right back on. This is the pair when she was off the nest there briefly. And they called and kind of displayed back and forth. And, and for anybody who's you know, not an avid birder, these birds can be seen outside of the Arctic in winter uh, along the Pacific coast. And sometimes they show up some other places. We do see them wintering in Prince William Sound. Uh, they don't look uh, nearly as pretty as this. I did photograph one. Uh, few weeks ago. I should have put that picture in here for contrast. Um, but it's one of the hardest birds to see on its breeding range or in its breeding colors in North America, and photographers go nuts uh, over an opportunity to photograph these. So I felt really lucky. Uh, here's one on the glass calm lake just stretching its wings. And then here's the pair interacting with the Brooks range in the background. I could not believe the setting and the, the species that I had in front of me, and this will be in my 50 favorite pictures of the, of the year. Uh, it was phenomenal. Uh, so I just felt blessed having this chance uh, right at the end of my trip. So that was the Arctic. That's something we can all do. Uh, that's right in, in our backyards, kind of. Although it took me 22 years of living in Alaska before I got around to it. Um, so the Svalbard trip was, I was working for a company called Cheeseman's Ecology Safaris. I've done a uh, guided two Antarctic trips with them and did this trip and I hope to be doing more in the future. Uh, this is the ship we were on. It's a French vessel called Polaris. And uh, so it had a French crew and then Scott Davis, he's the company owner uh, and myself were the two guides. He's been doing this with this vessel for like 15 years. So he was the institu institutional knowledge what I carried, you know, for experience that was helpful was I can pack a gun because everywhere you go, uh, you have to pack a gun in polar bear country. And then I can run Zodiacs and I can help photographers. And, you know, I'm somewhat familiar with Arctic wildlife. But anyway, that, that's the what I could offer as a new guide uh, to this country uh, in this area. How did they find you? Or did you find uh, He's been begging them for decades. Yeah. Hugh Rose was my connection. Do you know Hugh? Um, he's good friends uh, with a few people in town, and he's guided uh, these Antarctic trips. So I fell in through the Antarctic trips, uh, and uh, uh, John Bocci is a good friend of his. Um, so I uh, got hooked up through the Antarctic trips, and that led led to this, I guess. Uh, and then, you know, running boats was a huge, you know, check, but the yeah, being a biologist helped, being a photographer helped, and for the uh, Svalbard stuff, you know, pack, being able to pack a rifle was helpful. So just a handful of things that, that worked out. This is Scott Davis. He's the company owner, and he's been doing these Svalbard trips, and, and I've worked with him in Antarctica as well. Uh, uh, he lives in Monterey, California, or, or near Monterey. And uh, anyway, great guy, great to work for. What's behind the name Cheeseman? Uh, this is interesting you ask. Ted Cheeseman uh, and, and actually Ted's parents started the company. If anybody was watching the NBC News tonight, their, Ted Cheeseman was featured in a piece. He started the website called Happy Whale. And it's really oh, taking off. If anybody sure. takes pictures of the underside of a, of a whale's tail, they can upload it to the Happy Whale website. They will... Uh, if it's new, they'll put it into their database, but it probably won't be new. And they will send you emails every time that whale is recited, wherever it's recited. And just on Paula and I watched it, I go, I know that guy. You know Ted Cheeseman. Uh, they were as well. Uh, so uh, anyway, that's where the company, that's who owned the company, Scott Davis. Ted Cheeseman got so busy with Happy Whale, he sold the company that he kind of uh, inherited from his parents. And now Scott Davis, uh, who's worked with them for many years, uh, owns the company. These are our two sets of guests. Uh, this is the first group. There's Scott on the right and me on the left. Uh, this is near Alcornet, uh, which is a 
big seabird colony right over our heads, but also has uh, uh, reindeer and Arctic fox nearby was some of the things we were looking for on this hike. And this is our second group with about 150 walrus behind us. If you can see them uh, on the beach in the background. So we had two great groups, most I'll say mostly great groups of, of people uh, on each trip. But it was a small group. Uh, the Antarctic trips, you have 100 people. And there's a lot of hand holding. It was so nice to have just 12 uh, split between the two of us. So in the Zodiac, we had six. And uh, anyway, it was really intimate that way and custom, uh, which made it nice. And most tours to Antarctica will be on bigger cruise ships. Uh, and, or Svalbard is, is popular. There's a lot of tourism, ecotourism going on up there, but most of it is on 100 passenger or larger vessels. So being on this 12 passenger vessel was, was really a treat. I can't imagine. So if we were watching a polar bear, we had two zodiacs with six people each. You'd have 10 zodiacs uh, watching a polar bear you know, in, in the alternative situation with these bigger cruise boats. Uh, it would just be much more limiting what, what you could do. So for those not familiar, uh, this is uh, the Svalbard Archipelago. I showed you where it was. Uh, I'll show you where Longyear Bin is on another map. But note this island right here. This is in English, Northeast Land. Uh, the the uh, Norwegian word for it is Nordisland uh, or something like that. Go, go, good luck trying to pronounce the, these place names. Um, but this is the archipelago, and I'll show you some poor maps of, of our routes. But roughly on both trips, we left here, we went up this coast, we went around, and either down here and messed around in these places, or on the second trip came, uh, uh, oh, actually just around the corner right here. I told Hamish and Dana and uh, maybe Anita uh, yesterday, I think, about this. And this almost blows the mind, is because around here, a Tidewater Glacier starts, and it runs for 160 miles. Oh, wow. A tidewater glacial face, and, and I'll show you some pictures of that here in a second. So this is our first trip and all our stops. Uh, this is a little map that we kept on the wall uh, for the, you know, the passengers' sake so they can have an uh, idea of where we were. You can see some of the bear places where we saw polar bears. And this is the second trip, and you can see we wrapped around to the Ostfana uh, Glacier uh, ice field uh, right there, just, just the edge of it. Here's, uh, the, the, again, there's the archipelago with Longyear Bin uh, pointed. That's where you fly into, and that's where a lot of people start their cruises in general. It's quite a, a popular town. You know, it has a lot of tourism, but there's year-round residents there. There used to be some mining in there. there. There's less of that in the area now. They even have a ski lift now uh, so they can ski in the wintertime. There's a lot of Northern Lights tourism there. It's very pretty. But you'll find that common in Norway and Sweden. My, my, is this the place that has the uh, the seed repository? Yes. Okay. I, you I can so. see it near the airport. It was pointed yeah. out to me, and I've heard you can get a tour, but you don't go in. You just no. They, they, don't, they're not, they don't let anybody. Just get close to yeah, the, the, the international the, 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 the international seed repository yeah. is this tunnel in the ground into the permafrost where they have uh, what seeds of. Plants from all over the world. All over, going back thousands of years. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, on your previous photograph, on the far right there, yeah. what are those structures along the inside? They're avalanche protection, and with climate change, this place is seeing more snow than it has before. Avalanches had never really been much of a problem off of this slope, but they've had some big ones in recent years that have, I don't know if they, I think they killed people or damaged buildings. Uh, right in the town, uh, and so now they've had to build these uh, avalanche fences, you know, trying to hold it back. Um, but it, they say it's a it's a relatively new development. Here's a view of the, some of the housing in town, and it's touristy. There's a, a main strip where you walk with stores, a lot of gift st gift, gift shops and things like that. Uh, kind of interesting. Again, we're 600 miles roughly north of Prudhoe Bay. Uh, we're up there. And you can walk around in town, but you can't walk outside of town. Uh, there's signs that are saying you're not allowed past this point, that polar bears could be anywhere. And there's stories that we heard, you know, that people get killed almost every year by a polar bear, you know, somewhere in, in the in the archipelago.
I thought this was a great <laughs> name for the streets. <laughs> better moments. <laughs> and I don't do a lot of landscapes, but I'm going to show you some snapshots. Uh, a lot of these are just with my phone, uh, just around uh, the archipelago, different places we stopped. This is that Alcornet. I'll show you another picture of the top of it in a little bit. This is a huge seabird colony uh, right here. Um, but yeah, beautiful once the tundra thaws and the brief green up uh, in the summertime. We're running around in Zodiacs, you know, two of these. Uh, this is Scott Davis uh, with some of the clients from our second trip, I believe. We were hanging out in this spot because there was a polar bear that was sleeping, and we were hoping it would wake up and do stuff, but this, this one never did wake up. But we, we had photographed it earlier. Um, glaciers everywhere. You know, the, the western part of the islands have, have large peaks. The, uh, uh, the eastern part has a lot of flatlands. Uh, but yeah, it's just strikingly beautiful. Does anything grow? Oh, okay, there's a moss. Yeah, there. yeah. From what the hell is that? A green there, there's mosses and lichens, but there are flowering plants as well. Uh, and the only shrub or tree would be, you know, that's native would be some very, very low growing willows. Um, this is in Magdalena Bay, kind of in the northwest corner of the, the main island. And we went ashore here to go to a dove key colony, uh, Little Auk, uh, they call them. Here's our group going up the slope uh, to where the, they breed in a boulder field. Uh, but this gives you, you know, the type of views that we had and like, some of the hikes that we took. We didn't do a lot of hiking, but uh, we do some. And we got snow in July. Yeah, uh, Woke up to snow and had some on the deck of the boat. Somebody built a little snowman. <laughs> um, one hike we did to the edge of the big ice field, we found a polar bear skull, which is awesome. Uh, we photographed it and put it back where it was. And this is that Nortus land, the northeast land. And this shows you Ostafauna, Sorafauna. Uh, they're kind of uh, ice fields, ice caps that, that blend into each other. And like I said, the ice... Uh, the Tidewater Glacial Face runs all along here. 162 miles is uh, one uh, figure that I had heard. And I'll show you what it looks like. Uh, this is just this beautiful Tidewater Glacier. Um, we saw only about three to five miles of it. We went up just, just a little bit. But what's unique that I had never seen before is these waterfalls shooting off of it, you know, because it's this giant ice cap. And this is so you know, scenic, uh, noteworthy. It caught the attention of Pearl Jam, and a photograph of it was used as what their Gigaton album cover. And I thought it was neat how similar it is to the pictures that I took. <laughs> but it's striking. So anyway, it made an album cover. And this is just some of the views along uh, with those waterfalls shooting off. Uh, it, it was just spectacular. Here's you know, a tunnel with a waterfall shooting out of it. It was just a picture of my phone. Is it receding like crazy, or is, hmm? it, is it receding? It is. It's getting thinner, but but it's not as fast as some other glaciers. It's the third largest glacier in the European you know, side of, of the Arctic, and uh, it is receding, but not as fast as some of the other. Um, I'm sure it is because of all the icebergs, we didn't see calving, but, yeah. And now I'm going to start you in, now that I've kind of given you the setting, I'll start you into the wildlife images. Um, the first couple of days, I, I was right around the Longyear Bend town site, and I could walk all the way up to the polar bear sign, and uh, there was a dog kennel uh, right before you leave the, the area you're allowed to walk, and around the dog kennels, were a hundred nesting common eiders right next to the road. This is the log that, you know, for, for parking. And these are like literally right at your feet. Uh, and so it let you photograph common eiders like you could never photograph you know, almost anywhere else. This is almost wow. looking down on one, just a striking, striking bird with the, the shape of their bill and their, uh, just the coloration. Of, uh, anyway, beautiful, beautiful uh, opportunity. They were also, when I was there, they were just starting to hatch. And so I saw several that had chicks underneath them. Here's a hen with one of her chicks poking out. And there's what the drake looks like, common eider. 
Uh, again, we have these in Alaska and uh, our Arctic coast uh, in, in the summertime and make it down to Kodiak. Uh, I think they're commonly seen in the winter. And barnacle goose was a lifer for me, and they were nesting in that same area. We saw them many places throughout the archipelago. And now I'm going to kind of just introduce you to some of the general bird life that we saw, you know, in our travels, you know, uh, on the ship. Um, this is the black lake kittiwake. They're very abundant there, but also a bird that we see all the time around here. Um, they're on the nesting colonies, in some of the bird cliffs, there were huge numbers of black lake kittiwakes. Um, so for us, it'd be kind of old hat, but we still need to see them. We have pigeon guillemots, you know, common in Prince William Sound and rare in Alaska's Arctic because we don't really have cliffs up there, but we have black guillemots. Black guillemots, which look very similar to the ones we have, in fact, they look almost identical, were quite common almost everywhere we went. And they were pretty confining. Uh, in the Zodiac, they sometimes would swim right up to us or, or be uh, perched on uh, icebergs like this and let us get quite close. So these are black guillemots. Not, even though they look very much like the pigeon guillemots that we have here in Prince William Sound. This is on a nesting cliff, a black guillemot. Yeah, beautiful red feet. And the pigeon guillemots here have the same red feet. When they take off, they hold them out you know, to kind of use them for uh, you know, steering or for lift. And yeah, it's striking when they take off, they hold out those red feet. A bird we don't really see in Cordova, but you will see in Alaska's Arctic is red phalarope. There they call it gray. So they have a different name for everything. Gray phalarope. I, I don't even know how they get gray out of that. But uh, anyway, red phalaropes we saw just a handful of. But uh, that's something you would see in Alaska's Arctic during breeding season. A northern fulmar, which is something you could see in Prince William Sound occasionally, but in the Pribilofs or western Alaska, much more common. Uh, they were common at these breeding green colonies. Is that part of its beak? Yeah, it's on they're tube noses. Uh, so it's a family of seabirds that have a special little uh, pore on their nostrils so they can excrete salt, you know, from drinking salt water. Okay. Um, anyway, it's a it's a family of seabirds uh, that they belong to. They nicknamed tube noses. This is that same rock formation that I showed you, the scenic of uh, Alcornet is the name of it. We went ashore here on, on both trips, actually twice on both trips at the beginning and the end because it's not far from Longyear Bend. Uh, anyway, massive seabird colony right here. Here's a close-up of it. With uh, These are probably mostly black lake kitty wakes coming and going, uh, in the, the white birds in, in this image. But there's also um, many other species. Uh, the fulmars will be nesting in places like this. And then you know, I'll show you pictures in a minute, but uh, uh, Brennick's Guillemot or Thick-Billed Mirror are one of the common breeders in these sites. Okay, so here's uh, Thick-Billed Mirrors, or over there they call them Brennick's Guillemot. It would be rare to see a Thick-Billed Mirror in Prince William Sound in the Pribilofs. They're, they're really abundant in western and southwest Alaska. Um, anyway, massive colonies of these. Uh, they're very numerous. They, I think they're second in number to dove keys or little locks uh, in this in the Svalbard archipelago. But anyway, they're more prominent. Is there enough because, stuff out in the ocean to feed all those things? Yes, yeah, so it, like it, it's very productive. Well, it would be more like krill and shrimp and you know, small stuff like that, but also fish. and yeah, uh, They have really productive oceans, or they have to, to support all this bird life. There's a close-up of the guillemots or thick-billed mirrors. Here's from the zodiac, looking down the cliff. Look at all the birds in the air and all the birds on the water. Here's That's the soundtrack, right? <laughs> I only put it, yeah, and and the the shit track. Uh, you, 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 yeah, you need an umbrella. Here's Scott running one of the zodiacs with passengers, uh, looking at all the birds uh, flying overhead and on the water and on the cliffs. Here's Brunick's guillemot or big build mirror, as we would call them here in Alaska. Here's a bunch in the water right next to our zodiac also. Yeah, really numerous and, and actually pretty confining. One of my favorite birds of the trip were these guys. These were a lifer for me. In North America, we, we would call them dove keys. They mostly, they're rare in Alaska, uh, but off the northeast coast or of, of Alaska or, or of the United States or Canada, they would be more common. Uh, they're a tiny little seabird. 
uh, but it had that cute, you know, kind of like chubby little face. And uh, they're the most numerous bird in the Svalbard archipelago, but you don't, because they're smaller, uh, you might not notice them as much as you do the, the thick billed mirrors. Uh, but anyway, we went to a couple colonies. Here I do have a video. How do I, how do I play it? Uh, do I just advance? Yeah. Oh, you can't hear the sound, or can you? Is it easy to turn the sound up? Or anyway, there were thousands of them in this boulder field. This is where they nest. Uh, you can see flocks flying overhead. Sounds like laughing. Oh, I'll play it one more time. So they're round Yeah, yeah. But in crevices, you know, in, in burrows or crevices underneath the boulders. There are predators. There's Arctic fox here, so we got to be a little careful. In North America, dove keys, but little off is what they call them here. Yeah. And here's a close-up of one. And again, that's just the cutest little face and bill. What do they eat? Either marine invertebrates or little fish. Uh, yeah. In fact, yeah, many of them were coming back to nest and feeding young, I assume, in the burrows, and they had just oils or you know oozing out of their bills. I put the prettier pictures in, but, but uh, you could see that they were feeding young. Uh, we twice, once with each group, visited this uh, puffin colony. It's where I got the picture of the black guillemot on the nesting cliff. Uh, but anyway, Atlantic puffins, they were a lifer for me. Uh, they're also in the eastern, northeastern United States and eastern Canada, they nest. Uh, but anyway, we visited this twice with two different groups. And it just goes to show you, you know, the experience is different every single time, you know, no matter where we go or what we do. The first time we visited, there were strong winds blowing uh, from our back. And it was making these things hover like kites in front of us. So for flight photography, it was unbelievable. They were almost just floating in front of us at times. And so I got the neatest flight image opportunities. Uh, so here's the Atlantic Puff. And you can see every barb of every feather uh, of this thing uh, flying by. And here's a couple others. You can see how they use their feet for lift uh, when they're coming in for landings or taking off. Another Atlantic Puff. And here's another one again. It looks like it's just floating uh, right in front of me. So this was the opportunity we had on the first trip with the first group of 12. We came back, you know, like a week later. They were two 10-day trips, uh, and we visited the same site. You kind of think, oh, I'll get some more flight shots. Well, the winds were strong, but they were blocked uh, by the terrain. It was a wind from a different direction, so it was basically dead calm where we were. And it was impossible to get a picture of a bird in flight. They were so fast, or they were coming from down below and landing on the cliffs. But the converse was, is we had birds roosting on ledges right in front of us. And so we had the opportunity to photograph these birds, you know, just a few feet away from us at times. Here's two, uh, a pair of Atlantic puffins. Oh, that is impressive. <laughs> And this was kind of cool. The background was out of focus because I'm using a telephoto lens, but there was a rock in front of me that I was kind of using, uh, and it was equally out of focus, you know, because it was too too close between me and the bird, and it kind of made a Atlantic puffin dream photo. <laughs> um, this is a harbor seal. We have harbor seals right here, uh, but here in the Svalbard Archipelago, we saw these actually quite a bit. Uh, we were in the Zodiac watching a polar bear when this thing was checking us out, but they would also swim around the polar bear. They're completely safe uh, when, when they're not on the ice you know, around the polar bear, and they're curious and maybe even taunt the polar bear a little bit <laughs> because the polar bear has no chance of catching one in the water. Uh, so when the polar bear was swimming, uh, it was being circled by uh, seals at times, harbor seals. This is something we only saw like two of and only got close to this one. It's called bearded seal spectacular with those long whiskers, and I wish I had more opportunities to photograph these guys, but anyway, this is uh, the best that I did. Uh, anyway, they was, these were striking uh, because of those long whiskers that they have. No, I didn't either. And then this is the one, you know, other than polar bears, what most people want to see on this trip are walrus, and we had 
several opportunities on each trip. Uh, usually it was just a small group, sometimes in the water, sometimes on a beach. Uh, here's two walrus near our zodiac. And again, they were quite curious. They would come literally, you know, just a couple feet away, a few feet away uh, from the boat. Here's two checking us out. Those patterns of their closed nostrils are kind of cool here. Not the prettiest, at least by our standards. <laughs> They're interesting. There's one looking at us from the water. But uh, on the second trip, towards the end of the second trip, I was looking through the binoculars. I'm constantly on deck, Scott and I are, glassing for polar bears. You know, you have to look hard for them and cover a lot of distances uh, and just spend a lot of time looking. We saw 12 bears over two 20-day trips, you know, about half a dozen for each group of people. Uh, but it took work. So in the process, you're also looking for other wildlife. On the, towards the end of the second trip, I'm looking through the, the spotting scope on deck. I go, Scott, is that possible that I see like 100 walrus in front of me? He goes, no, I've never seen that many walrus before or, or hardly ever have. Well, it turns out there was like 150 walrus hauled out on the sandbar. And we ended up, it was late in the day, we anchored the, spent the night there. And the next morning we went ashore and we walked to about within 50 yards. Uh, they weren't bothered by us at all. And so we were watching this group of walrus uh, from the beach. Uh, 150 of them all laying around, mostly sleeping, but they raise up like this every once in a while. There's the, the bulk, the hulk of a, a walrus on land. This one has just one horn, one tusk. But the neatest thing happened is we were on the water line about 50 yards away from that bigger colony, and there were some walrus coming and going in the water you know, near the colony as well. But they take an interest in you and get curious, and we had two that swam over to us, you know, just real lazily. They just sort of uh, moseyed their way over to, in the water directly in front of us. Scott and I were, and one of the passengers were right on the water line, and then the rest. All the passengers behaved perfectly. Everybody was quiet. They moved slowly. They didn't go digging for tripods and running for a better position because you could have spooked these away very easily. Um, but anyway, it was amazing how they came into the shallow water, kind of crawled partway out of the water. They were not even 10 yards from us. They used two walrus just checking us out. Are all those uh, marks just like a lifetime of scratches? Yeah, so yeah, like yeah. Uh, and and uh, their mating behavior involves some rough housing like, like that too. That's where some of that might come from or males fighting uh, you know, you know, took over mating as well. And they're but, never aggressive to inflatables? Google walrus attack zodiac. Uh, have you seen this video? No. Google walrus attacks uh, Zodiac. There, I had never expected, or su suspected that they might be aggressive. I don't know how often they are, but this will scare the hell out of you if you're ever near a walrus. There's a picture of a Zodiac being lifted by a crane from a boat like ours, you know, because we had to lift the Zodiacs all the time, and this walrus raises itself out of the water and is jabbing the pontoons with its tusks, deflating the boat, just destroying it. Uh, I don't know what they did to bring on that behavior, but apparently they can be aggressive sometimes. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, it's an impressive video if you want to uh, remember to look that one up. So do just the males have the, the tusks? No, both do, oh, and okay. females have smaller ones. And I don't know for sure. I, I'm assuming these are both males, but that, that could be a female with a smaller tusk, but I'm not sure. I think he's wondering if you've seen that video. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, you know, the passengers could have been freaked out by that, but they were. They all, that, it was amazing how calm they, they all were, and it was just a wonderful moment for these five or ten minutes while these two walrus checked us out. Um, Svalbard reindeer, they're native. They've been on these islands for like 10,000 years. Uh, I was kind of curious about that. We use reindeer for the domesticated version of caribou. So like I said, I, was, I wasn't sure of the status of these, but no, they're, they're native to the Svalbard, Svalbard archipelago. They're kind of shaped, if you guys have ever heard of Piri caribou that occur in uh, Canada's high Arctic, they're kind of short stubby bodies and short legs. Uh, compared to the, you know, the bear's ground caribou that we see more often. Uh, anyway, here's a, a bull that was bedded down. Uh, we had some cows and calves come. We, we had all dozen of us and the guides would just sit on the tundra, and we had them graze quite close. A female with a calf uh, came by. 
And here's one of the females right there, kind of looking wild-eyed and uh, shedding her, her winter coat still. And then one of the other neat critters that we saw on land, and underneath some of these big seabird colonies, uh, Arctic fox would be denning and raising pups. Uh, one den, there were two dens in this one area uh, that we visited several times beneath, beneath the bird colony, and one of them had very small pups, and the other one were pups just about to leave the den. This is some of the smaller pups that we saw at this site, Arctic fox. <laughs> Here's one of the bigger pups yawning. This is one of the adults with a kitty wake uh, and sticking its feathers in his mouth. Like, what kitty wake? I haven't seen any kitty wakes. Caught <laughs> red handed. But this is what everybody wants to see when they come to Svalbard. And there's not a lot of places in the world you know, where you can really go to see these. You know, what comes to mind are Svalbard, uh, Churchill. We used to have Kaktovik, but they've closed tourism there. Um, there is Wapusk uh, Park in Canada where they see females with cubs uh, in the winter or you know, early, early spring. Uh, but there's just not a lot of places to go. They're, they're hard, it's hard to get where, where they live. Um, but anyway, we had to work hard for seeing them. So they're on land now. Uh, they're waiting for the ocean to freeze up again, and they don't have much to do. They, you, you know, I'll show you that they do eat, you know, uh, occasionally, but their main way of of making a living is catching seals on the ice. They're very good at that. When seals have to come up the blowholes, and they wait at these places and can find uh, seal pups, you know, under in chambers under the ice. Anyway, they're very good at that, but they really can't uh, feed much, so they're just kind of hanging out. But we saw about a dozen, maybe 13 of them. They were very used to seeing people. They weren't alarmed. They were even a little curious at times. And so the interactions were very neutral. Uh, you know, they're not all, also not being fed. And we're in Zodiacs. So we were never on land uh, viewing these. We're always in a Zodiac. And there's our ship in the background. The thing uh, had just swam and came ashore right here. Uh, here it is. It's walked over to the shoreline right near us. You're supposed to stay about 30 yards away from them. Uh, this thing is just scratching, rubbing his head on a rock. When we left that evening, it was getting kind of late. He almost looked sad to see us go. Uh, you know, they're a little bored. Uh, you know, probably it's a, a little, you know, they're curious uh, when they see us. Uh, it was pretty neat just watching this thing uh, stare at us as we were leaving. Here's another one we found that walked into the upland a little bit, uh, backlit in the afternoon sun. I did not get pictures. I'm running the Zodiac. So what pictures I do get are kind of opportunistic. You know, I'm running a Zodiac, you know, so that the passengers can get pictures. So the, the passengers end up with a lot more and better pictures than what I'm able to get. Right after, there, there was a plastic discarded bucket, and it put this blue bucket on its head uh, <laughs> right after I took this picture. And some people got some funny pictures of that. Here's one swimming. We had to kind of idle away from it. It was coming towards us, but not aggressively. It's just curious. This is a shack that some of the backcountry rangers use when they're doing field work. <laughs> it would have been pretty alarming being in this. Uh, there was nobody there, but uh, Scott Davis on another trip had seen a polar bear sleeping on the same shack before. <laughs> yeah. Here's one just loafing in the water. Again, they're just killing time. As cold as the water is, it's nothing to them. They'll spend hours swimming or just playing in the water like this. Say that again. I'm so sorry. Yeah. He's like, what you say? Yeah, yeah. This is one of the snowstorms that we saw. We were there. So there's about two things that can, you know, provide them with a little bit of food in the summertime. They can find a carcass of a walrus or a marine mammal, a seal or a whale or something. Um, you know, that's probably a little bit of a rare event. We did see one feeding on a walrus carcass, uh, actually the one that was swimming and that lounging in the water just then. There was a, a walrus carcass nearby. Um, the other thing they do is they go to islands and they bird dog and they look for eider's nests. And this pair of bears, it was a female and an older cub, we watched get four eider nests within about a half hour. Uh, again, they're just walking along, and when they smell it or see it, they kind of will hustle up to it, and the hen will flush at the last second. They probably occasionally catch the hens, uh, and then they'll just eat the eggs. And, you know, 
it's got to be just a snack for them. It's something to do, you know, compared to a meal of a, of a seal or something. It's nothing, and they have months to get by in the summertime. But anyway, they spent some time doing that. And some of the best luck we had finding polar bears was going to these islands where they were hunting eider nests. This is one of the same bears. The snow had quit. This is the, the adult female. Beautiful, beautiful, clean coats. Uh, just gorgeous, gorgeous bears. And here's one who had just predated uh, eider nest. She had flushed from the nest and sat nearby as the polar bear ate the eggs. And the polar bear walked on by. And, uh, yeah, it was a bad, bad day for the duck. Here's another one that we saw uh, hunting uh, uh, eider nests on an on island. And there was something buried underneath some ice, some shoreline ice that this thing was trying to get to. There could have been a carcass frozen in the, in, in the it, was, it was the winter shore fast ice that was you know, you know, blocking its access to something. It was sniffing around trying to get to it for a little while. And this was the last polar bear we saw. It was a big adult male, beautiful, beautiful bear. We, it was way inland when we first, I spotted it through binoculars a couple miles away. We uh, got the zodiacs out, we went to shore, and just about the same time it made it to the water, and just walking across land with that coat and you know that fur that they have, they're hot. So it got in the water and cooled off for about 30 minutes, and we just sat back in the zodiacs and watched. It came out of the water, walked along the shoreline, and then it found this, pat, this shelf of shore fast ice with snow, and just rolled in it, and that made you know some of the best polar bear images of the entire trip. You know, for about a minute or something, uh, it rolled around like this. <laughs> <laughs> and then it walked up and over the hill. You know, here's two images of it uh, walking away. And that's all I got. That's what I threw, I, I threw in here. That's all. That's all. <laughs> Oh, are there any questions? Thanks. So do you take the Zodiacs back to the ship uh, every day, or do you yes. stay on shore? No, we, we stay on the ship, and, you know, the Zodiac rides, you know, we might do two or three outings a day, and they might last, you know, two to three or four hours. People get cold, and you're on the water, and it's, well, we did have some actually very nice weather uh, on some of the trip, but we also had weather that cools you off pretty quick. And so when you get back to the ship, you have lunch, then you go back out again. Always bringing the Zodiacs back on deck, you know, lifted with the crane and uh, stored on deck. The crew, the, the ship's crew takes care of most of that. Yeah. Uh, how many crew? How many Frenchmen? Uh, so there's the, the boat captain, a, uh, a co-pilot, you know, captain. Um, there was an engineer. Uh, there was a cook. And then kind of a host, uh, there was five or six uh, that were running. They were all French, uh, very nice. Captain was a little hard to communicate with, but all the rest were really good. Yeah. So are all these tour companies, are they going to the colonies too, like you were? Or do they, are they no. just focused on the, the bears? It's probably just, the, there, there's some sailing vessels, you know, like Hamish's boat with smaller groups. They might be doing some shore landings. Uh, the bigger vessels with the hundred, they're not going to the puffin colony or the dubkey colony. Uh, they they might have some shore landings, but they're more generic, you know, uh, going for a hike where there wouldn't be much wildlife or something. Yeah, you know? but it is limited. You know, and they do see polar bears from those. They do see walrus from those. Um, but yeah, I can't imagine doing the same thing with ten zodiacs or more versus our two. Uh, so it, it is a neat way to go with a smaller boat. And where did you anchor at night? Did you just in little bays? Or? The coves, the captain's watching the weather, he knows the country, you know, has the charts, and so there's all kinds, you saw the shoreline in the maps, all kinds of you know, protected was, bays. What was the weather like? I mean, it was a good mix. Weeks. We did, we were, I was told that, you know, it's like way calmer than Antarctica. It's nothing like that. It's a smaller ocean because you have shelf ice, you know, the, the pack ice, maybe 100 or 200 miles offshore or something. Uh, but there is a lot of protected bays and passageways too, so it's nothing like the seas, of, you know, the the Southern Ocean. Um, but that said, we had some good storms, and some of the passengers, there were some was some seasickness, and they thought it was rougher than what they were led to think it was. Uh, on the second trip, in particular, uh, it was a little rougher than what 
you know, maybe it typically is on these. But in general, it's it's a uh, much yeah, it's it's relatively you know easy. Like good like C is, and good anchoring. Yeah. yeah, lots of good places to protect it areas too. And the captain's watching the weather, and you know we're just we're you know, gauging where to go, you know, to be in the lee of, of you know different storms that are coming. Do any people live up in these areas? Or is that where the Laplanders uh, are? No, that's not where the Laplanders are. There's like there's some Russian communities and mines and uh, mostly south of Longyear Bend. Uh, there's some research stations uh, just north of Longyear Bend up the coast is one, uh, New London, um, and there's a science some science research base, some bases. Uh, so there's a little bit here and there. But but not much. Most of where we were to the north of Longyear Bend, that we were on the northwest coast and the north coast is very little. You know, maybe just some of these huts that are used occasionally, you know, by field workers and stuff. So there's not like a big fishing community anywhere. No. Uh. -uh. Got I'm not sure if the fisheries are protected within a certain distance of that island. I, I think there is some protection nearby. Uh, and you can see how important it would be to these seabird colonies, you know, keeping the fisheries and stuff in good shape. The uh, captain would drop a line down every once in a while. I should have put the picture in. And he was catching Atlantic cod uh, on occasion. And one of the passengers, it was uh, a kid. There was a, a, a family, a, a man who was an attorney and his uh, grown kids, a daughter and son. And the son wanted to catch a fish. And so he got the, let the, cap, the captain let him use his rod and drop it down. And he got a really nice Atlantic cod that might have been 10, 12 pounds or something like that. We had it for dinner uh, one night. He was proud as could be to have caught that. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Yeah. You mentioned the, the plastic buckets. Was there a lot of plastic trash? In, you know, Not places? as much as I've seen in other places, but yes, there, fishing there was. Gear or? Some fishing gear, like there was some yellow rope s stuff that I was seeing pretty commonly. And, uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't terrible. It wasn't as much fishing gear as you know, like yeah. you see here. Yeah. Uh-huh. Do it sometime, or if you can't, just drive up to Dev that, that's That is doable. Yeah. Well, thank Thanks, you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you for coming. If you didn't sign in, please do, because, you know, we have to kind of keep track of some people. And then next month, November 19th, 7 o'clock, same place, Aaron